We have four speakers. Uh, you may wonder why I'm put here as moderator. It's not my field and a long way from it. So I'm, I suppose, sort of a workhorse of soup. So if there's a little gap somewhere, I try to fill in. Uh, so my job will simply be to introduce the speakers. And if we have time to moderate questions, I hope there will be time for some questions and discussion, but that's uh, up to all of you. Uh, the speakers will go in the order in which they are in the program. So our first speaker is Akif Kirachi, who has a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. He's a member of the faculty in Bilkent University in Ankara, Turkey. He's vice president of the Turkish National Commission for UNESCO and a member of the board for Fulbright National Commission. He's the vice president of the group for the IGC for MOST, the MOST program of UNESCO, which we've already been uh, hearing about. So I'll turn the speaker over to Akif. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for being here today. Before I start, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to the organizers of this excellent conference, in particular the Liège City, Liège University, SIPSH, and UNESCO MOST, among many others. Today I will give a brief outline about borders, physical and mental and try to understand how we create them. And if we need them, and if we overcome them, if you will. Borders highlight the sites of division. They divide individuals from many different backgrounds from each other by defining a limited territory for them. This division is strengthened in national borders through citizenship and passport requirements. When individuals acquire certain privileges through the concept of citizenship, they identify themselves with the territory that is limited by their nation's borders. All individuals who identify themselves with the same territory also identify as a group. An understanding of us emerges between the members of the same nation who hold the same privileges and identify with the same territory. While borders divide people from each other, they also merge the ones when they are on the same side. Emergence of the concept of us also creates a concept of them, which defines everyone else who are outside the borders they identify with. However, this division is not only limited to the borders, but also related to people's perceptions. People cross borders every day, every hour, every minute, and every second. People are en masse to move from one border to another legally and sometimes, and most of the times, illegally. <clears throat> People pass through borders <clears throat> with or without passports, through checkpoints, and even through walls. And then there are other sorts of borders. They enshrined in people's minds and hearts. We build them step by step in our children's minds through education. They become stronger than real concrete borders. They become impossible to break or to breach. It is the one that we need to fear. I will come to that notion later. And But first, take a look at the notion of borders again. What are they for and if they are useful anyway? <clears throat> Sorry. What is a border? It is an artificial line that separates geographic areas. Borders separate countries, states, provinces, counties, cities, and towns. A border outlines the area that a particular governing body controls. The authority or the government of a region can only create and enforce laws within its borders. Therefore, borders are political boundaries. Are borders stable and static? Sometimes the, the people in one region take over another area through violence. Other times, land is traded or sold peacefully. 
Many times, land is parceled out after a war through international agreements. And for several reasons, therefore, borders change over time. Do we notice borders all the time? Most of the time, when we travel, we go through controlled borders, checkpoints. But sometimes, borders fall along natural boundaries, like rivers or mountain ranges. For example, the boundary between France and Spain follows the crest of the Pyrenean Mountains. For part of its length, the boundary between the United States and Mexico follows a river called the Rio Grande. And then, for instance, Africa's Lake Chad is a border for four countries, Niger, Chad, Cameroon, and Nigeria. Therefore, borders sometimes are not demarcated and therefore may not be noticed. Countries protect their borders for several good reasons. One is to keep out invaders. This is especially true in, a, in areas <coughs> where two or more countries have fought over the same land for many years. Cambodia and Thailand, for example, have disputed the, the territory of the Preah Vihar Temple for more than a century. Cambodian and Thai military units are positioned along the border near Preah Vihar Temple, and skirmishes often result in deaths on both sides. India and Pakistan dispute the region of Kashmir, you see constantly in the news. Cyprus is divided along the lines of uh, between the two different lines in the Tur Turkish northern part and the Greek south. Every country has its own rules about who may travel, work, and reside within its borders. Visas and work permits are government documents issued to non-citizens that limit the type of work or travel they may do in the country and for how long, like the green card in the United States and or Schengen visas. Many countries require visas, some common like Schengen, like I said, some alone, some flexible like Turkey, some with stringent rules like the UK and Israel. They have very diligent requirements to issue a visa and for whom. Many countries deploy military presence along their borders for no simple reason than to deter the enemies. Or neighboring countries, fences and even walls, big walls, long walls, like we also hear in the news again uh, by Trump, or neighboring countries, I'm sorry, like the ones in Israel or the one is being built along the borders between Mexico and the United States. Or better yet, walls once between the East, divided between the East and West Germany. And or walls that divided um, China, the great China Wall, from the nomadic tribes. Are they relevant? Well, borders all are all well protected and controlled, to a certain extent, obviously. Sometimes borders serve to keep citizens within the national perimeters of the demarcated lines of a country. National borders <coughs> affect travel and migration. People can usually move freely within their own country's borders, but may not be allowed to cross into a neighboring country. Most governments with these closed borders are not democratic. In addition to North Korea, for instance, nations such as Myanmar and Cuba rarely allow their residents to cross their borders. Borders in this case serve not to let citizens out, which reminds me of the movie Fury Road. And then there are disputes, especially when there are some natural resources over which demarcation lines pass, or borders pass. Or as it was the case when Saddam invaded Kuwait, which was a direct military occupation to control the natural resources of another country. So in this case, having borders didn't work to protect natural resources of a country. We can uh, extend the examples of similar sort. Border disputes develop many times as one ethnic group wishes to break off and form its own independent state. This is currently what is taking place in northern Syria and the north of Iraq. Similar threats may surface in Scotland, not necessarily with violence, Catalan region of Spain and several other places around the globe. South China Sea is in the news these days as an example of an attempt to expand sea borders. So borders are disputed. If that is the case, why do we need them? 
Why do we need borders? Why do we have them? Well, according to some scholars, they are useless and hamper the free market economy, stall development, raise hopes for better lives and earnings. I cannot decide whether these views are purely liberal or some aspects of anarchism. I like them anyway. For others, borders make our lives easier. That is to say, borders make states function better, exercise their authority better, and prevent unwanted people infiltrating to a country. They provide better control of the movement of people in and out, and so on. You can uh, exemplify the uh, similar uh, management aspects. All of these approaches concern with economics, labor studies, security studies, management, identity, and sovereignty, the usual set of studies in political science and IR. In the, however, in the wake of such catastrophic developments during the last five or six years in the Middle East and in Africa and in Asia, i.e., I mean the mass migration movements because of a civil war in Syria and Libya, because of a drought in Africa in particular, we have chosen the easiest way to react to these gigantic humanitarian crises to fortify the borders with the hope that it would keep the catastrophe away from our civilized daily lives. This solution was easy, but not necessarily humane or humanitarian. The European Union fortified its borders by seducing Turkey, my country, to stop movements of people towards its borders, amplified the presence of war vessels in the Aegean Sea, the UK and Hungary rejected Germany's proposal to distribute migrants among the member countries proportionately. The US Congress rejected Obama's appeal to accept 10,000 Syrians and so on. More news of this sort appear every week almost. When we look at the host regions around the globe, Europe ranks at the bottom in terms of how many uh, migrants uh, countries uh, host. But the perception, however, among the European citizens is ex exactly the in, uh, indicate the contrast. The choice of closing borders reflects to the most enduring walls in our minds, that our education, especially with a boost from mass media these days, with the help from Daesh kind of radical groups, instilled in us. By running away from this enduring issue, I underline the notion of issue problem, in fact, ironically, reinforce, we reinforce, and amplify the problem. In this case, like I said, I use um, crises vis-a-vis -vis problem, because this problem is enduring, and it is not, nowhere to, it's, it's not going to disappear uh, anytime soon. By closing physical borders, we in fact also close the borders in the minds of those who seek to cross those borders, come to us, those who want to be like us, we are telling them that under any circumstances, they are not visible. By taking the hopes away, we are reiterating the arguments of late Edward Said, once, who in 1979 argued, quote, the Orient is Europe's cultural contestant and one of its deepest and most recurring images of the other. In addition, the Orient has helped to define Europe or the West as its contrasting image, idea, personality, exp experience, end quote. Sorry. These are the very convictions that feed up to us versus them and West and the rest dichotomies, which in return boost clashes between cultures, regions, and identities other than dialogue. On a relevant note, I'd like to mention one interesting notion related to education. Um, that is a common and generic course that was created especially after World War II. That is Western civilization or commonly known as Western Civ courses that is offered in many universities or in uh, quality high schools. The 
the crust of that course was the Western civilization as it is today is the top accumulation of all human experiences as exemplified in the writings of Hegel. And that is, that is it. There is no other civilization. But that approach started to change, um, I, I would say, about 15 years ago. I started seeing some books called uh, The Heritage of World Civilizations, Common Heritage of Humanity, uh, and so on and so forth. Those books now include other experiences uh, in human history, like Asia, China, Japan, India, um, Africa, Islamic civilization, and so on and so forth. But we need to do more on this venue. Xenophobia, radicalism, these are the notions that I'll end up with them, but um, I need to go over a couple of other notions before I end. Popul populist politics is one thing, uh, also boosting this kind of us and them dichotomy. Some politicians, however, do not fall victim to these kind of um, daily uh, discourses, like the mayor of Liege in his opening speech. Uh, he declared that this city is not going to be uh, a, you know, a place of radicalism, and I applaud uh, him for these statements. These statements, however, the, po the, the daily politics, <coughs> They affect these closed or fortified borders approaches, but on, on our part, members of academia also need to develop a fresh approach to these issues. When studying migration and borders, political scientists and international relations experts concerned mainly about how the trade and economic relationships get affected by the borders. Some even called borders, quote, trade barriers, end quote. Management of migration, the, uh, the adaptation of migrants, law enforcement, education, land use, etc. These are all classical notions that we sort of, um, st that's how we study migration and our borders. Humanitarian aspects are still missing gravely from the migration and border studies. Human humanitarian aspects of migration <coughs> should be integrated into the larger body of these disciplines. Humanitarian diplomacy, conflict prevention during humanitarian crises, delivering humanitarian assistance to the conflict within zones, ETC, will help greatly. We need to bring especially sociology and psychology to the studies of migration and border studies. I'm sure international studies and political science will benefit a great deal from such interdisciplinary approaches, and then we, would, we don't have to abolish humanities humanities, sciences, altogether. These are the fields that we need to develop fresh approaches. As a warrant, I must <coughs> add the following. <clears throat> By continuing the current pol policies, it seems that we are, or Europe, is saved for now. But the humanitarian catastrophe didn't disappear. When considering especially things that are taking place in the Levant, and I want to emphasize the word Levant, its historic and cultural importance for the very presence of Europe and, and <coughs> the <coughs> European, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, European civilization. Almost half of the Syrian population were involuntarily displaced, several millions of them out of their country, and many more were internally displaced. Obviously, these are nowhere close to the numbers that are actually on the ground. 65 million people this year, I mean currently, displaced from their homes. More than 65 million people. The stark picture here is that there is a lost generation. Millions of children have not been attending schools because of the civil war in Syria and Iraq, even if the majority of their material presence is prevented to appear from the gates of Europe. Their non-material presence is still there with us. It is this lost generation <clears throat> that is at the danger of being haunted by extremist radical groups. It is this lost generation that might plant seeds of despair and plight, which again would lead to cyclic traumas 
the effects of which will catch us wherever we go. It is for this lost generation we must mobilize our physical and mental resources so that they have means to access education. And by the way, the UN Geneva reminded yesterday, some 20 hours ago, by tweeting that everyone has the right to education, one of the major articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This lost generation's inability to access education shouldn't be viewed as, a, viewed as an immediate crisis, but rather a continuing persisting challenge again. And in order to produce a meaningful policy, we need to tackle borders and walls in our minds first. Fortified mental barriers feed up to the notion of clash of civilizations once argued by Samuel Huntington. Uh, unfortunately, it is the most cited article in our field. The clash of civilizations trope pervades hundreds of years of interactions between the West and other parts of the world. Obviously, I'm not proposing a borderless world, which is beyond idealism. What I am proposing is that uh, first, defeat the mental barriers by remembering that as the richest part of the world, by ignoring the plight of other people, we might feed radicalism and xenophobia from both ways, here in Europe and in other parts of the world, which might threaten the base of open society and free market economy. That the base of Western thought and rationality mainly inspired by the works of Aristotle, whose works were preserved for centuries by Muslim scholars. They were the ones who translated their, his works into Arabic. To remember that the boundaries of cultural categories are highly permeable, that Christianity today is the bedrock of Western civilization, is a Middle Eastern religion. If we start from these simple facts and drop the prejudice for our, from our curriculum, for which we need to input of both academicians and policymakers, that will be a great start. The second thing I am proposing is that, at this point, it seems that regulated openness, instead of totally open border policies, regulated openness with a managed system of migration, we can overcome many challenges that are currently being accumulated. Since no state will drop its claims over sovereignty of its borders, a managed and feasible system would just defeat the many great challenges awaiting us. Considering the current rising numbers of people who are being displaced voluntarily or involuntarily, I think there is also a dare need to develop a global and more humane management system of borders and migrations for the world. Current practices are deformed by many challenges, such as the operations of organized crime networks, human trafficking, trafficking human organs, trafficking children, migrant smuggling, and so on. Smuggling weaponry, is also, and also artifacts. In line with the suggestions of Kosh, um, whose article appeared in, uh, in, in a book that uh, published by UNESCO, the system requires a coordinated arrangement among the states and the involvement of several institutions, at least to declare and apply the regime of acceptance, regulations, and the time frame. He also suggests that the new regime mechanism or mechanism shouldn't supplant the existence international instruments, but rather reinforce them. It also should work through intrastate agreements, not as a supranational construct. Um, on a relevant note, last but not least, UNESCO MOST, MOST stands for Management of Social Transformation, uh, for which Group 1, I am the Vice President for the Intergovernmental Council. Uh, last year, we developed four major teams for the member countries to focus on. One, migration. Two, de-radicalization. This is not necessarily for religious radicalism, but also for ethnic radicalism in the West and in other parts of the world. And third notion that we suggested member countries to study, transformative influence of the social media. Now UNESCO is in the process of forming a separate study group on that. Uh, this is 
individual, social, but also it is important for, for instance, ISIL uh, recruiting a lot of terrorists from using, by using the social media. So we need to look at these uh, fields as a new uh, fields of studies and also a fields of challenges. And the fourth notion was intercultural dialogue. With that, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, and that's a very good beginning with a number of important questions raised. Uh, I should go on and introduce our next speaker, Vladimir Kolosov, Professor, Deputy Director of the Institute of Geography of the Russian Academy of Sciences and head of the Center of Geopolitical Studies and the Department of Geography of World Economy at the Faculty of Geography of Lomonosov Moscow University. Uh, he has had many awards. His scholarship and research covers a number of fields, uh, political geography and geopolitics. He's written the most important textbook on political geography in Russia. He has been head of the International Geographical Union and uh, edits a, a journal called Regional Research in Russia. So with no more, I introduce you. Thank you for your contribution. Okay, good afternoon, dear colleagues. I would like to uh, focus my uh, presentation on a short uh, outlook of uh, contemporary border studies from the perspective of, of a geographer. Uh, border studies is a very um, fashionable and very popular field of research among uh, experts in different disciplines. Uh, our colleague Virginie Mamadou, uh, head of IGU, International Geographical Union Commission on Political <coughs> Geography, uh, said that borders are now everything and everything is bordering. Everything can be considered from the perspective of bordering. And she uh, called uh, this um, proliferation of border studies, borderitis, a kind of disease. Uh, of and, uh, its manifestation is the need to transcend the borders between disciplines. We can uh, notice that uh, borders are the institutional, structural, functional, and ide ideational uh, dimensions. And contemporary border studies uh, has, uh, have uh, moved away of, oh, sorry, of, 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 from um, uh, an almost exclusive concern with the borders between states in the international system to the study of borders at diverse social, spatial, and geographical scales, scales as a single system, ranging from the local and the municipal to the global, regional, suprastate compartmentalization of the world in a post-Westphalian period. For an exclusive concern with geographical, physical, and tangible borders to those which are cultural, social, economic, religious, and in many cases invisible, but with major impact on the way in which human society is bordered, ordered, and compartmentalized, and respectfully from geographical approaches to interdisciplinary studies. From case studies to the understanding of the ways in which human society is bordered, and order it, the process of bordering, which, is, which can be defined as an everyday construction of borders, for example, through political discourses and institutions, media representations, school textbooks, stereotypes, and every, uh, everyday forms of transnationalism. In other words, borders are not a semi-permanent formal institution. Uh, our Italian colleague Fabrizio Eva called this need, social individual need in uh, bordering, self-caging. In, in, uh, every individual indeed needs a protection, uh, sees uh, the uh, border as protection against outside threats, as a mean to separate himself or herself from the other. 
a, uh, it's a way of seeing, thinking, talking, and producing borders in terms of James Scott, who is among us. Understanding interrelations between different kinds of mental and formal borders. Exploring mechanism of everyday bordering. Uh, the key concepts of border studies are respectively bordering, de or rebordering, in other words, uh, the transfer of important barrier functions of borders to uh, an upper or a lower level. Uh, borders are multidimensional um, because they are different from each uh, kind of activity, uh, every individual. They are mobile and bo borders are not only, uh, um, they not only separate different territorial units, but also uh, they can be located around uh, special zones around um, large international airports and so on. Borderscapes is another important concept of um, in border studies, which defines uh, the space along the borders with uh, where uh, neighboring social, cultural, political spaces penetrate uh, each other. Uh, borders are now understood as important resource uh, as a source for cross-border regional integration, for which uh, cultural dimension is extremely important. Uh, this uh, simple table shows uh, uh, this understanding of borders as, uh, at the same time uh, constraining and enabling feature, enabling processes. Borders uh, can be considered as resources for development, integration, conflict resolution, resolution of common problems, communication, and mutual uh, learning. Everyday bordering uh, um, important themes of uh, contemporary border studies are um, um, the role of specific border identities and border as instrument of identity building, uh, populism, marginalization, uh, which is important and uh, particularly uh, nowadays because of uh, this uh, current refugee crisis. Uh, bringing borders, uh, bo border studies bring locality to the political agenda. Uh, border crossings ca can be uh, um, considered in terms of culture, ethnicity, gender, family, work, otherness. Uh, it is important now to define what is neighborhood what should be understood as uh, challenges of neighborhood. Contemporary border studies uh, uh, reject binary thinking. Uh, they are closely related for the search for compromise and reconciliation. They redefined such notions as hybridity or liminality, which has always had a negative connotation. Uh, the relations between borders and peripheries they reinterpreted center periphery patterns, so important for in many countries. There are no good and or bad borders. Uh, uh, the old, um, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, the old, there is an old contradiction between circulation and security very well known by border scholars. Because uh, paradoxically, flows are the main feature of globalization and at the same time they are the major cause of insecurity and instability. And migrations are considered by political elites and public opinion as a major threat. They give rise to uh, and fix uh, internal socialist and uh, even political borders. The contemporary world is involved in a large process of securitization. Security is everything, everything can be justified by this uh, sacred notion of security, uh, linked to global threats and risk, and uh, uh, characterized by a worldwide rebordering process. Uh, securitization of borders is not an attempt to close space uh, and territories, which is vain but to filter transnational flows and to sort them between legal and illegal, welcome uh, and I want it. Uh, in 2012, the total length of existing border barriers, physical barriers, uh, as concrete walls uh, or even minefields, were estimated in about 22,000 kilometers. About 13,000 kilometers were under construction, which approximately makes up 16% uh, of world's land borders. 
and paradoxically only 16% of existing border barriers emerged as a result of conflict uh, or as ceasefire li lines like between India and Pakistan in Kashmir, DMZ in Korea, between Abkhazia and Georgia. Most barriers were erected along peaceful boundaries like between the US and Mexico or between Schengen countries and their neighbors. The growing use of military equipment and technologies such as cameras, sensors, radars is a quickly developing tendency in fencing the borders. Biometric control is combined with the creation of huge databases and data variance is the systematic monitoring of individuals' personal data through the application of uh, information technologies and uh, the logic of the security continuum, which erases the distinction between domestic and external security, territory and borders. And respectively, data veins and the search for security generate the risk of fundamental right abuses and put fundamental political and moral uh, problems. Um, another uh, field of uh, border studies uh, is the cultural uh, uh, functions of uh, borders. Borders like places, as places of negotiations between tradition and modernity. Borders as spaces of fear, captivity, disorientation, even panic, and at the same time, if, uh, if part uh, particularly creative spaces. Borders as theater, like uh, here uh, in uh, South Korea when uh, the famous uh, tunnels uh, digged up, uh, up by North Koreans to penetrate the South Korean territory are transformed in an impressive museum. Uh, borders are proliferating and respectively border studies, uh, I think, will uh, develop further because of the multiplication of polities. The number of polities in the world are continuously, slowly, but continuously increasing. Then uh, there are territorial claims on the North Pole and Antarctic, on the bottom of the open ocean and deep sea waters. Uh, there are claims related with artificial and disputed islands. A uh, lot of uh, salient attempts to redraw border lines on the ground or at the sea. It's a, certainly, to my opinion, a long-term tendency because the main trend of our century is a combination of globalization with the growing social and territorial inequality and gaps between groups and states, separate states, region within the states, and social strata. Global economic, technological, informational, cultural, linguistic systems set international norms, rules, and standards of economic and political interactions, undermining traditional notions of sovereignty and national interest, which undermines uh, traditional borders uh, make uh, this notion uh, and the, the function of borders more complicated. Borders are, of course, intrinsically related with migrations, uh, provoked by a, com a combination of dramatic gaps in the quality of life uh, and at all levels uh, and to increasing ethnic and political tensions. And the historical experience of many countries show that no political border as a social institute can cope with this challenge. In the long and even the mid-term perspective, no them can resist to such pressure. In 2015, 2044 million people, or more than 3% of the world population, were international migrants, including 20 million refugees. Of those, nearly 60% came to the developed countries. Um, a significant share of those people either moved across the border in violation of the existing legislation or violated the law in some other way, overstayed their visas, engaged in activities not allowed by their status, and so on. Uh, the United States hosts uh, 47 uh, million migrants. Uh, illegal, uh, most and uh, about 11 million are illegals. Uh, it is the uh, largest Im immigrant receiving state, but maybe it is less known that Russia quickly became the center of the second largest immigration system of the world. 20 million of uh, current Russian residents were born outside the country. Uh, migration creates transition zones uh, and borderland spaces in the territorial heart of uh, other polity which leads to the fragmentation of political space at lower levels of the territorial hierarchy and the increasing importance of internal, local, and especially reticular and quasi-political borders. 
and such new borders become barometers of political and military power of different groups and communities, symbols of their autonomy and economic success, a field of competition between different internal and external political players. Uh, the last but not the least, I would like to stress that uh, the postmodern reality is characterized by the interpenetration of controlled and uncontrolled areas. Dozens of states in the world do not control uh, the full, their full territory for decades, and uh, the boundaries between them are often transparent, and the circulation of people, goods, and capital is fluid. It blurs the very notion of the state boundary, which becomes vague and loose. The region looks like an archipelago of sovereign domains divided by a number of boundaries delineating sovereignty in different fields. But in some cases, the boundaries between the areas under control of a legitimate state and uncontrolled territories are completely locked from front lines. Uh, if I, to my opinion, uh, the state, whole state system is, uh, uh, will uh, divide it uh, again and again, uh, because all encompassing identities are replaced with tribal, uh, often replaced with tribal loyalties and bold religions with a complicated interplay of new confessions and sects. We uh, observe a revival of the civilizational split, like in Russia, Turkey, Iran, uh, history is viewed through geopolitical lenses. We observe the growth of the number of dwarfish and small states. The continuation of de- and rebordering, the emergence of new borders and new types of borders, assuming only part of their normal functions, while another part is transferred to another polity to an upper level. The diversification of the global border system, the increase of its complexity. Um, to conclude, uh, I think that the nature and the feature of border identities, or identities as borders, or borders between identities, uh, is um, an important unexplored theme. Uh, then, um, mobile identities and uh, shifting bond, uh, boundaries are not uh, studied enough. There is a gap. What is the meaning of the gap between uh, generations? The phenomenon of fluctuating borders, control on the territory and identities. The emergence of contemporary board system of borders, the historical dimensions and history of contemporary uh, borders, different forms of human territoriality, borders and identity in the past, for example, in the areas of transhumans, in the mountain areas, uh, the role of seasonal and temporary cross-border migration and the appearance of new international nomads moving to another regional country for a month or a season, for instance, uh, construction workers or agricultural workers. Uh, the post notion of territory is uh, a sort of space of political belonging, which is not necessarily defined in terms of cultural values. The spaces of cultural identification span over multiple scales, and their boundary are social rather than geographical, as uh, the Italian geographer Marco Anton stressed in one of his papers. We observed a shift away from bounded spaces in favor of open relational places as a way to grasp better a reality shaped by flows, networks, and the interplay of scales, like in the case of Ponte Greeks, for instance, transnational macro regions recently established by the European Union as a new form of territorial cooperation without fixed boundaries and formal institutions based on the concept of mobile border eliminality, a geometry variable. Uh, finally, there seems a, to be a huge disconnect between the ambition, claims, and mindsets of some politicians and populist movements and the academic fascination of for post-national borders. Academics are generally not successful enough in communicating their nuanced understanding of bordering process and state territoriality to geopolitical actors. Thank you uh, for your attention. Well, thank you very much for that. Very enlightening. I think we've had two wonderful, almost sort of introductory talks to the field touching on so many problems that there are
questions that are bound to arise, I hope, at the end. Um, the next speaker is Ms. Or Professor uh, Lucia Mokra from Bratislava, where she's Dean of Komnenos University, the Faculty of Social and Economic Sciences. She is a professor of International and European Union Law at the Institute of European Studies and International Relations. Her professional focus has been on international and European law with research involving European citizenship, human rights, migration, and the judiciary of the ECJ. Her new concepts are involve also changes after the Lisbon Treaty and the rights of migrants and third country nationals. I think I will, she has so many qualifications, but she's a graduate of the uh, Cambridge Diploma in British Law and European Union Law, and serves on the research board at the University in Bratislava with uh, PhD students and vice president of the National Committee of the UNESCO MOS program, which seems to be, of course, a theme among our speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, welcome uh, to the auditorium on the presentation I would like to share with you. This presentation is uh, more practical, uh, as I spent last two years by training of the border police officers on the Slovak-Ukraine Schengen borders uh, about the protection of the human rights of migrants. So it will focus on the Slovak Republic uh, fulfillment of the obligation to European Union uh, in relation to the migration policy and asylum policy, as well as to the uh, UN obligations, which is focused on the protection of the, of the human rights of people who are forced to migrate and who just uh, ca uh, came uh, to Slovakia. So uh, my presentation is, uh, is uh, based on the experience we, we already have in Slovakia. And however, it's not so big, uh, a big experience. There are some good examples uh, of, the, of the practices which were transferred to legislation uh, and, to, and to practical policies that the government is implementing in the field. So, uh, my presentation, as I already mentioned, is, is the focus on the, on the way how the Slovakia, as the, as the EU country and the UN country, fulfill the obligation, as we are very much criticized in the media and also by the, by the European Commission about non-fulfillment of the obligation to uh, somehow uh, get the refugees and migrants and that there are so, so many obstacles uh, made in the, in, the legisl in the national legislation that people are not aware of getting the, the status of a migrant or refugee in the, uh, in the country. So my presentation is focused on how we fulfill the UN Convention on the Rights of Refugees and the European Union law, especially in relation to Dublin, Dublin regulation and the status of the, of the refugees uh, in the pro, uh, from the procedural point of view. So it means that, uh, as far as you know, uh, there are many uh, legal acts which are frameworking the, the work of the, of the concrete state. The Slovak Republic is the signatory country of the, of the uh, most important UN legal uh, acts. So we are signatory country of the UN Convention uh, on Refugees from 1951, as well as the, as the additional protocol. Then the Convention of the Rights of Child, because in this relation we are also talking about an, uh, unaccompanied minors who are uh, traveling without their parents or the, the adults, and they are crossing the borders uh, from the Ukraine to Slovakia, the EU borders. There are approximately 50 uh, annually, and uh, there is a special uh, procedure which has to be taken uh, over, over them. And of course, there is a, 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 the UN Convention on the Stateless Person. Many people are coming without the travel documents, without the ID documents, and the procedure process is then much more complicated uh, for, the, for the national authorities. Uh, the, another regis legislation which framework uh, our, uh, our work in the country is, of course, the EU legislation, which was adopted uh, since, uh, uh, since 2007, uh, uh, since the Amsterdam Treaty. And uh, the most important one is the last one, the Dublin Regulation, and then the Dublin, uh, sorry, Dublin Conventions, and then the Dublin Regulations. The other directives and regulations which is working and focusing on the rights of the third country nationals, the Eurodac establishment, the cross-border cooperation between the countries and the joint teams of the police officers and bo the border, sorry, the border officers. 
Uh, the Dublin Regulation is quite famous. It sets the international standards about the process uh, the country uh, has, to, has to follow. And in this relation, we have, of course, some kind of implementation uh, problems because the national legislation was not uh, approximated to the Dublin Regulation. So it lasts some, some times the, the national parliament approximate the legislation to be uh, conformed to the European standards. The Dublin Regulation sets the principles uh, I would like to, uh, or within which uh, we work in the, in the, in the practice. Uh, one of them is the human rights protection. So once uh, when the national authorities are dealing and fulfilling the legal obligation, they have to, of course, uh, consider the protection of the human rights of individuals, which is sometimes uh, on, the, on the other side of the, of the pole. So it means that the, on one side is the obligation the state authorities have to fulfill in relation to European Union or to UN, and they have to report to European Commission. And sometimes on the other side, there is the, the main objective to protect uh, the individual human rights, uh, which have to be guaranteed on the different levels uh, of the protection. So from this point, uh, the, the Slovakia had uh, adopted several national documents, the strategies and uh, work on the action plans, which uh, are reflecting the, the work experience and the field experience from the, from the Slovak-Ukraine border, as it is the external Schengen border. And there is a much more uh, responsibility of the country to protect this, uh, this border from the point of the obligation to the European Union. There are three main of them which were adopted after uh, the migration crisis started at the end of 2008-2009. The first one is the integration policy, which states uh, the general uh, principles of the integration policy in relation to migrants, refugees, and the, the minors who just traveled to, uh, to the country. And then the second one, which was a really long-lasting uh, process, or the output of the really long-lasting process, is the National Strategy on Protection and Promotion of the Human Rights, where the separate chapter is dealing with the rights of migrants. Uh, as uh, there were, as I, I already mentioned, many uh, procedural obstacles. We didn't have the, the proper law on, uh, on foreigners, and uh, the process, uh, once uh, the administrative process on granting asylum was really long-lasting, and with uh, some uh, legal pro problems like uh, uh, the non-effective uh, work of the appellate procedure and uh, the problem with the, with the judge's uh, uh, experience in the area of uh, migration law and the obligation to the European Union law. And the last one, which was, uh, which was adopted and set the priorities by 2020, is the migration policy of the Slovak Republic perspective until the year 2020, which uh, stays uh, or just set uh, the basic pillars and principles upon which uh, the action plans in concrete areas have to be have to be elaborated. Uh, once I said that uh, the action plans has to be elaborated, it means that the, the concrete ministries are working on the concrete action plans in relation to the different categories of migrants, uh, for example, and different uh, categories of the human rights. They are guaranteed, like a right to education, which was already mentioned, in relation to minors, and uh, especially in unaccompanied minors, then the right for social inclusion and right to work. And of course, uh, the special action plan is uh, is elaborated by the Ministry of Justice in relation to protection of their judicial rights. So it means like a granting of the legal service, the legal advice, uh, the, uh, the guarantee of their right for a fair trial in relation to the proceeding in the language they understand and so on. Um, many of them, or majority of the, of the action plans are just on the way, uh, so it means we have only uh, the basic pillars and within these action plans, uh, the st different stakeholders, the ministries, NGO, the civil society, the experts, and also international experts are working together to have the action plans which can be really enforced in the practice and which will help the Slovak Republic to fulfill the obligation in relation to the European Union and the United Nations. So, as I mentioned, the, the action plans are, on the, uh, or are within the process, and in this relation, uh, many of the, uh, the basic, or, uh, the basic uh, 
process or basic steps are uh, derived from the concrete practice. There are not so many uh, examples of the, of the problems or proceedings which are uh, in detail stated uh, from the practice. There are not so many applications for the, for the granting the asylum, as the Slovak Republic is not the final destination country, but still there are some of the examples which can be used and from which we can uh, derive the concrete uh, recommendations to action plans in a different areas. I decided to present you two uh, judgments of the Supreme Court of the Slovak Republic, which are uh, the judgments of the final instance and which reviewed the, pro the whole process of the administrative authorities which are working with the migration uh, law in the Slovak Republic, especially in the, in the Schengen border with the, with the Ukraine. These two are especially relevant, or why I chosen these two as an example uh, is, um, sorry, are, uh, that uh, these uh, two applications uh, give us some kind of a basis to understand why sometimes the process is really long-lasting. The first one had started in 2004, so the, the person already uh, crossed the border illegally in 2004. Uh, the application came to the Supreme Court in 2015 and the decision was adopted in December 2016. And the second one is, is very similar and it is connected with one of the la uh, latest principles coming from the Dublin regulation, uh, the European criminal law, especially if we are talking about some small uh, group of people who crossed the border illegally and then within the free movement within Europe they moved to another country and they committed uh, the crime and then they came back and the country has to decide firstly about their, uh, their asylum position and then of course there is the second obligation in relation to the enforcement of the criminal uh, offence in relation to this person. So these two uh, will be the, uh, the or somehow provide us explanation and maybe understanding for the recommendation we uh, get or we, de we delivered uh, to our government in preparation of the, of the action plans and which can be used somehow as a, as a lesson learned examples to other countries which are in similar or same situation. The first application was uh, the claims of a person who was original, originally coming from Palestine and who work uh, or uh, who, who came uh, to, uh, to Slovakia in 2004 and uh, who mentioned uh, the first, uh, in the first meeting, in the first interview after he uh, illegally crossed the border within the detention process and within the filling the application that he has only economic reasons to come to, uh, to Europe. And of course, the Slovak Republic is not his uh, final uh, destination. So it means that uh, once he claimed, and it is in a written form, uh, verified uh, by his signature, that until he will not be uh, released or detained on the Slovak borders, he will definitely not apply uh, for the asylum in this, in this country, in our country. So he stated that uh, he has the reason to uh, come to the Europe or to the European Union to work in some of the uh, better conditions than he had in the previous, previous position. He uh, left the Palestine in 2004 and he was uh, living for 10 years in Turkey where he was employed. And then because of the problems with the economy and with the uh, changing of his interest, he decided in 2014, left the country and came to the, to the Europe with the final destination should be uh, Germany, France or United Kingdom. Unfortunately, from his point of view, he was uh, uh, taken into the uh, detention uh, in the Ukraine-Slovak Slovak borders and he applied for the asylum. He never changed uh, the reasons for his application, for the uh, asylum application. However, he was notified by the legal advisors that uh, uh, these economic reasons are contrary to the granting the asylum and that only the human rights reasons are stated in the national legislation which are conformed to the European, to the European le uh, legislation. Uh, so he didn't uh, mention any of the uh, reasons which are stated in the first paragraph, which are conformed to the European Union law and which are conformed to the UN Convention on, the, on refugees or on the status of, uh, of refugees. However, uh, he uh, claimed uh, that his rights for granting asylum were violated 
and the Supreme Court had to, had to decide about uh, the uh, justification of the dismissal of, the, of his, uh, of his uh, asylum uh, application. As the, uh, as the whole procedure, the appellate procedure up to the final decision of the Supreme Court has the, the effect of the postponing effect until the December 2016, he was legally uh, residing in the refugee camp in the eastern part of the country upon the state ex uh, expenses. So his rights were in this way uh, guaranteed and uh, he was only expelled after the efficiency of the Supreme Court, Supreme Court judgment. From this point of view, the lesson which was learned was about the, the enforcement and uh, the the whole procedure which was considered, all the steps were considered as a valid and justified by the Supreme Court. So the national authorities from the primary one, the International Office for Migration, then the, uh, then the state uh, responsible authorities which are granting or refusing the asylum procedure were considered and trained that their decision was correct. The second application was a little bit complicated. Uh, the, uh, the applicant uh, came uh, from the Indian Republic and uh, crossed the border in 2000, illegally crossed the border in 2006 and applied for the, for the asylum procedure. As from the point of the human rights protection, the refugee camps doesn't have a strict regime like, uh, like in prison, that uh, people are really like uh, living there with all the social support and uh, uh, children have the right to, uh, to attend the schools. Uh, uh, the refugees receive uh, the legal advice and the support in, in a way once they are granted at least some kind of a protection to find a job or to work uh, on their uh, language, for example, they can attend the, the Slovak language course and so on. Uh, this kind of a liberal regime in the refugee camp led uh, to the uh, situation that this person uh, left the country, uh, of course, again, illegally, moved to the Italy, and then from the Italy illegally to the United Kingdom. In between uh, of his stay in the United Kingdom, he moved several times to the continental Europe and committed uh, a crime. In this uh, relation, this person uh, just used uh, several different identities. So he was uh, known as, uh, as RS in the Belgium, then uh, the BB uh, uh, in the country, and then, uh, of course, in the, uh, in the United Kingdom, he used the identity BS. He committed twice the crime in the Belgium, and there was issued the European arrest warrant against this person with four different identities, which means complications in identification of the person and the work and the help of the Indian embassy was, was requested. Upon the European arrest warrant, the person was uh, expelled to the Slovakia, where the, the process, the whole process of the asylum granting just continued because there was no possible to decide about his asylum from 2006 as he was not present and he, was, he didn't provide any authorization to the legal, uh, legal uh, authority like an uh, attorney or the, uh, the other representative which is entitled to national law to represent the, the, the person. So uh, his application was, uh, was dismissed and he was not granted the asylum. And there was, a, of course, again, the, another problem which came uh, to the mind if uh, uh, he was dis his application was dismissed and there was the order, the court order to expulsion uh, him back to the country where he Ill from which he illegally crossed the border, how to enforce the, the liability for the criminal, criminal offense. In this relation, the, the Supreme Court just stated that uh, there is no possibility to initiate or to proceed the proceeding once he will be expelled it from the from the European Union based on the dismissal of his application for the for the asylum so these uh, two uh, examples just uh, describe or should uh, explain how uh, sometimes the procedure about the grant, uh, granting asylum about application may be may be complicated and some of the recommendation for the for the uh, legislation uh, changes uh, are based on this uh, Supreme Court decision but there are also some positive examples it's not only uh, uh, always complicated uh, 
The uh, Slovak Republic was working uh, quite hard in a, from the legal point of view about the changing of the national legislation to guarantee the rights of the individuals and also to fulfill the obligation in the era of the migration law. Uh, in 2006, there were uh, adopted recommendations of the European Commission based on the three uh, basic areas, the creation of the common procedure for the international protection, then the implementation of the uniform standards, and the harmonization of the reception conditions in the European Union. In this relation, the Slovak Republic legislation was changed and the asylum procedure is fully harmonized with the, with the European Union uh, legislation. We have the, the appellate procedure. We are fully guaranteed the right for fair trial. It's the part of the administrative law. And since the reform in 2016 from the efficiency of this year, uh, uh, January 2017, we have the new code of the administra judicial administrative proceeding. So we have a specific senates on the, on the regional courts which are dealing with the migration and refugee, refugee law. So we have a specialist or the judges who are focused on, the, uh, on this, on this uh, complicated but separate agenda of the, of the law. And uh, in, this, uh, in this relation, there were adopted also some other uh, steps uh, in relation to the uh, Republic uh, work in area of the, of the migration, uh, the uh, appellate procedure, the intra-EU solidarity, uh, where, uh, where the Slovak Republic, because there were not so many applications for the, gra uh, for the uh, grant asylum or for granting the asylum, we tried to manage our uh, work within the European Union membership in different ways. So uh, based on the bilateral agreement between the Slovakia and Austria, people who are applying for the, for the asylum in Austria and there were no space for them until their uh, uh, application is decided until the, uh, about their application is decided. We are leaving for uh, for a while in the in the Slovakia, just uh, behind the borders in the special special camp uh, which was used for this purpose. Uh, then uh, there was. Uh, changed the legislation in relation to, to minors. There was stated that they are obliged to attend the education once they are uh, living uh, within the refugee camp until there was adopted decision about, uh, about the uh, asylum application, what means that this I hope so. These children will be not the lost generation. However, probably for them, uh, the education in Slovak will be will not give them so much chances uh, on the international market. But at least they can they can learn and they can have some kind of abilities uh, connected with the school education. And of course, uh, the Slovak Republic was trying to uh, work or cooperate with other countries in the resettlement of the uh, of the of the people who applied uh, in an asylum uh, in the Slovakia, but they uh, want to move somewhere uh, to other country based on the bilateral agreements. Uh, several uh, people, uh, the Somalian nationals, were up on the bi bilateral agreement moved from the Slovakia to the United States based on the bilateral agreement as the country as our country was not their final destination and there was a will of the United States in 2016 to uh, invite and welcome these, uh, these people. Uh, so there were uh, Somalian, uh, Somalian nationals, Sudanese and Ethiopian nationals who came through the eastern uh, border of the, of the Slovakia, the Schengen border. So, uh, based on this, also somehow negative and also the positive obligations in uh, the process of preparation of action plans, we uh, formulate several recommendations which should be involved there and which should help to improve and make the uh, migration uh, law or the asylum law in the Slovak Republic uh, enforceable and more, uh, more efficient. The first one is uh, in a way of the implementation uh, or the work of the national authorities. In the um, report of the European uh, Migration Network there is state, from 2016, uh, there is stated that there should be established uh, the special national unit for combating illegal migration. So it means that there should be uh, somehow changed or spread the uh, the network of the of the authorities which are dealing with the with the migration, especially with the illegal migration, and which can provide expertise to government, to Ministry of Interior, and the Foreign and Border Police Office. Uh, the United Kingdom promised to give some kind of a supervision over there, 
And this uh, unit was established at the beginning of this year within the Ministry of Interior, which is responsible uh, for, the, for the police uh, officers uh, at all. Uh, unfortunately, this is something what we uh, missed uh, so much, and probably that's the problem also in the other countries. There are not enough uh, experienced people who can serve as the experts in the national unit. So it means that we are somehow rely on the other countries and the training of experts and sharing of the knowledge with the other countries who, uh, which have more experience like the, the Italians and the Greeks. The second one is uh, uh, the recommendation which led uh, to, uh, or which was formulated in relation to the preparation of the action plan, was uh, the cooperation of the relevant state uh, authorities or the stakeholders. Uh, we really uh, recommend uh, the government, which is many times trying to uh, did it uh, alone, the cooperation with, uh, with the NGO sector, with the civil society, as well as the academia, because there are many uh, relevant researches uh, done already in the other countries in the world, we can see the lessons learned from the from the research and from the field experience the other stakeholders in the world, not only in the Europe, have, and we can learn by this practice. We recommend uh, different uh, cooperative projects, as I already mentioned, the one which uh, we applied in the field and we just finished in the April of this year was the one uh, cooperative project between the Ukraine and Slovakia about the protection and better management of the Schengen border which was supported by the Norway and uh, their, uh, their financial mechanism. But there are some other uh, examples of cross-border cooperations, like uh, the joint police teams, which are already operating in, uh, in Greece or in Macedonian borders where the Slovak police officers uh, participate. The third recommendation uh, get, uh, go to the area of the social policy and, uh, and education. Uh, in this way, uh, the people who are uh, living in the refugee camps usually for several months up to several years, they need uh, to somehow train or improve their skills to be somehow prepared for the for the market. They need some kind of a social social help, and for the uh, uh, for the from the point of minors, also the education uh, they have to be educated. Uh, the education is also connected with the, with the adults who usually are traveling without the documents, and it means that they are uh, missing also their uh, education certificates. So one they would like to work uh, within the Europe, not only within the Slovakia, once uh, they will be uh, uh, legally residing there, they need some kind of a training or uh, some kind of a recognition of their documents. So the, uh, the social policy and the education policy should uh, be aware of this uh, special uh, position or their special status in the country. So it means that we uh, recommend that the action plan for education, which was adopted two years ago, should be amended in a relation to involvement of the obligatory Slovak language classes for the, for the children who are in the refugee camp, as well as for the adults, to be at least aware of the, of the procedure or of uh, daily, uh, daily life in their surrounding uh, and in the, in the refugee camp. And the last but not least is really important uh, recommendation. Uh, we have in the Slovakia since 2010 the, national, uh, the Act on the National Language, which means that uh, the state authorities are obliged to use the Slovak language as the official national language in all the procedures, which means in practice that also the foreign and borders police use the Slovak language in daily life. They are not obliged to use the English or uh, the French or the, uh, the Russian language. However, they have some kind of the knowledge. The whole proceeding had to run in the Slovak language, or there is, of course, uh, the obligation to provide official translation upon the state, uh, state budget. From this point of view, we recommend to amend the legislation at least to use the other languages on the equally to the Slovak one in the proceeding to guarantee the same level uh, of the of the uh, protection, the same uh, protection of the procedural rights of the of the migrants who usually have uh, knowledge at least about one of the language or the basis of the another another language. From the point of the protection of their rights in the administrative proceeding, of course, or the judicial proceeding, of course. They are entitled to uh, the translation, but for the first contact, they should be guaranteed at least to use the language. You can imagine that if uh, someone is uh, uh, 
catch on the on the borders at two uh, in the morning in the dark, and uh, they are uh, of course uh, trying to speak English or any other uh, language like. Uh, uh, in the, uh, they are they are affair, uh, afraid of their life or whatever, and the Slovak police border officers are using only the Slovak language. There there were many complications, and uh, some of the situation led also to the use of uh, guns, at least for the for the information of them. They they are illegally crossing crossing the borders. So to prevent such a situation and to prevent any uh, threat of the of the of these people who are forced to migrate, uh, we recommend uh, at least the using of the other other languages. And uh, in real, yeah, the, the last one is uh, uh, focus on the on the protection of the of the migrants in the in the proceeding. So the judicial rights should be uh, guaranteed. As far as you know, the uh, the Strasbourg Court said that uh, the right for fair trial, so the equal non-discriminatory trial, involves any other pre-trial proceedings. So uh, the First contact, or since the first contact on the on the on the borders, everything has to be conformed to the legislation, and the Slovak Republic, in this way, made the progress, which was evaluated already by the European Commission, uh, that we conform or fulfill the fulfill the obligation. So, uh, to sum up, somehow, uh, what I wanted to say and share with you is that. The enforcement and efficiency of the current legislation in the European Union and in the international law, in the UN rules, uh, should involve much more uh, stakeholders and also somehow work at least on some on guidelines uh, which set the detailed rules uh, coming from the practice. We have many examples on the borders in, in Italy, in Malta, in Greece, in the Slovakia, which can be shared between the, between the police officers, not only from the point of the official notice uh, about the concrete examples, but like guidelines which can help to train them and which can help for a more efficient work of a joint teams which are operating on the external borders of the European Union. In a way, uh, and the second point is that the obligation fulfillment, I mean, to fully uh, be harmonized with the EU legislation or international legislation should be every time considered with accordance or in accordance with the human rights protection. Those people who are illegally crossing the borders, however, they have a different kind of uh, purpose. Yeah, purpose. Uh, they are individuals, they are human beings, and they are entitled to protect their human dignity. dignity. The third one is the procedural guarantees uh, that the system should uh, protect their uh, judicial rights from the point of administrative as well as the judicial procedure. And the last point is that all the policies implementation right now in relation to the country should be based on the action plans, which should be as soon as uh, possible adopted uh, to be uh, aware of how it, uh, it is cor correct and conform to our international obligation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. I think it was actually very helpful to hear some very specific problems. Uh, so we've gone in this paper from the general to the specificity of uh, enforcing borders, the legal this time. Uh, and I want to come back at the end to these various notions of what a border is and how it's constituted and how it's agreed and what ways are being used, always exploring different ways, uh, it seems, to sort of keep people out. So our last speaker is actually going to bring another perspective, a very valuable one, this Tim Jensen, who is currently Associate Professor in the Department of the Study of Religions and the Institute of History in the University of Southern Denmark, and an Honorary Professor at Leibniz University in Hanover, Germany. He has worked for many years with the International Association of the History of Religion, so he's well known within the SIPS, of course, and he's been president of the Danish Association for the History of Religions. His research, uh, he points out, has moved from a training in what he called classical uh, history of religions, where he achieved the historical and philological expertise to study the Greek religion, he has a very uh, deep historical perspective, but in more recent times, he's been interested in religious education, the study of religious uh, methodologies for teaching, or the teaching of religion in school. 
His research has also focused on uh, the state handling of religion, legally and otherwise, and in public and political discourses on religion. So we're very lucky that he's also here today to give a different perspective, perhaps. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, you haven't told me, but I guess I have about five and a half minutes, right? Is that correct? Or if not, I will have to ask you to leave ever so quietly if you have to go at six o'clock, because I'm not going to end at six o'clock, Sean. Okay. It's impossible. I will try my best to keep you awake and not thinking about drinks or food or whatever at I this time. I think you should take the time that you were allotted. Thank you. Allotted Good. I also time. try to do this. I have some PowerPoint here, so I will try to work my way through this. Now, whether we are talking about borders or boundaries, in this panel it says borders, physical and often at the same time metaphysical, as well as metaphorical, demarcations, limina, thresholds, doorways, etc. Scholars of religion or scholars linked to the academic studies of religion have for more than a century developed theories about religion in, and its various, various dimensions, for instance, ritual and symbolism, which directly as well as indirectly also are or explore theories about the importance and meeting, meanings of notions of boundaries, borders, borderline cases, especially, of course, such with special relevance for the study of what is called religion. Migration, too, as attached to religion or people who may be linked to religion, has played a role both in connection with borders and boundaries. For instance, boundaries or borders set up in relation to identity construction and politics, or in connection with the description and study of migrating religions, the religions of migrants and exiles, and of course also of exiled religions. Add to this the core questions within the study of religions about the identification of what we decide to call and look at as religion over against what may be otherwise just called culture or politics, and about the reasons we or religious people or not religious people may have for calling something religion, most often demarcating it from the rest of culture or other kinds of culture, including, of course, the questions about what it is that they or we refer to in order to make it religion. Borders are, of course, also important when it comes to define or identify a study of religion study, for instance, as compared to a theological or religious study of religion. How do we make sure that we study it in such a way that theology or the like is evidently something that some more or less significant other deals with on the other side of the border at a clear distance from the non-theological study of religion? It goes without saying that there are different opinions as to where exactly such a borderline is to be drawn, when, how, and where more exactly a scholar and his or her work crosses from the one into the other. It is, inter alia, a discursive struggle, a matter of classification, and thus a fight for having or getting the right, the authority, and the power to classify and to define not only what is religion and what is not, but also what counts as a study of religion and what does not. This is one border or one borderline that I was forced to stop by when I was visiting Ekaterinburg a month or so ago in order to go into a dasha of a professor to drink beer and vodka and have a banya. And they wanted me to stop and I said, well, what is this? This is a borderline between Europe and Asia. And I, of course, said, this is ridiculous. In the midst of nowhere, there is a borderline between. What is it? But it was a great fun for a lot of people going to celebrate their weddings. So all these crazy people drinking champagne, they went there and they put their bottles, empty bottles of champagne, pretty poor champagne actually, in some wall and they, they were all happy. They didn't know anything about the symbolism of borders. I think it was just a habit, a tradition. That's part of the fascination of borders. Why did they go there? Why did I have to stop there? And here you see scholar Jensen pondering 
what the hell is this all about? But I'm also actually pondering here whether I should say a few more words about the more sort of theoretical and metaphorical sort of studies of borders within the study of religions, or whether I should just move directly to what I thought about immediately when I read the title Borders and Migration, namely Europe, trying to keep out of Europe people from outside the normal borderlines of Europe, especially people who happen to come from countries that might in one way or the other be called Muslim. But that was my immediate thought when I had the title. You have to say something about the study of religions in relation to some very specific issue and challenge of today's Europe. And I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do both and, because this is about borders. So I will end up probably betwixt and between. I will try to do both and. Just on my way to do both and, what is it we have up here? You cannot see it. I couldn't photograph it really. It's a dragon and it's a rooster. My Russian professor, who is not in the study of religion but in sociology, she said that's because the dragon is a symbol of Asia and the rooster is a symbol of Europe. And I said, nonsense. It has something to do with these animals being liminal symbols or animals. The rooster, it crows at the break of dawn, right? And the dragon is the gatekeeper. So it's animals in between, messengers, etc. She disagreed, but I think I'm right. It doesn't matter that much. But this is, of course, what I want to say right now. Several very, very important traditions within the study of religions, they deal with culture, religion, society, and symbolism, sort of in terms of mental, cognitive, social, cultural classifications and categorizations. These are studies that also sort of imply questions about the possible links between local and universal modes of cognizing, of ordering the world. So it's about cosmology, it's about sociology, psychology, and anthropology. In this perspective, large parts of what we call religion and studies of religion are about making order, defining purity and its opposite, establishing and transgressing taboos. It's about liminality, hierarchy, etc. It's also about orgies, New Year's rituals. It's about turning everything, everything upside down, inside out, with regular intervals. Names to be dropped are, of course, Dirk Heem, Hubert and Moos, Herz, Van Chenep, Rite de Passage, the symbolism of the Lehman and the threshold, Mary Douglas, purity and danger, body and society, dietary rules, it's Edmund Leach, taboo, danger, dietary rules, defilement and sacredness, and it is not least Victor Turner, rituals and symbols of liminality, it's betwixt and between the need for creative chaos as well as for cosmos. Contemporary cognitivist notions of moderately counterintuitive superhuman agents, that is human yet also more than human, may also be counted in, and so may various studies of why it is dangerous to look into the setting sun, especially if you are standing on a beach, and why it is strictly for people to wear a swimming suit if you are working in a mine. Magdicative devices, strange rules, may all become more understandable if linked to the study of the construction of categories and the ambiguity of that category that mixes or conflates two or other otherwise clear-cut and well-defined and separated categories. As for my own scholarly career, studies of notions of order and disorder have played a central role, not least in my initial study of cosmology and sociology in the Homeric epic poems, with special regards to the notion of the Greek term hubris and the Greek hero. I don't have the time to talk about this, but this is my favorite topic still, that is the Greek hero as a liminal person in between the gods and the beasts. And it's also the study of Greek sacrifice where you construct sort of the difference between gods and humans, the immortals and immortals, at the same time as you build bridges and destruct the borders. I cannot go into this, but I find these studies fascinating and I have written something about it here too. Now, when we move to studies of religion and migration, mention of course may be made of studies of migrating religions that results in modes of syncretism. So when we study syncretism, in a way we also study migration and crossing of borders. And there are several modes of syncretism. 
It goes without saying also that the sociological study of religion is in special, now as before deals with migrating religions, with majority religions becoming migrants, minority religions, with state handling of religion, identity politics, nationalism and religion, and with the use of religion in contemporary neo-nationalist projects, and with the use of religion as regards integration, assimilation, segregation, etc. And of course, we will have a lot of studies of religion and globalization, and I could name lots of scholars and lots of titles, and you'll just fall asleep. So now I want to move to something else. I would like to go to this one. I would like to move into something that I mentioned before, the actual situation of having an alarm that Europe, what we call Europe, what is defined as Europe, whatever that is, is being invaded by people from outside Europe. So we are back to all of these terms and notions of in and outside, etc. And here you see a Danish cartoonist, so to speak, from the very famous Jyllandsposten. That was also the daily that produced the famous cartoons in 2005. It's not the same cartoonist or illustrator, but it's an illustration to an article where it says Europe is still sort of sound asleep, but it's not that sound. And you can see the threat, of course, is Islam. So we will have to, as scholars, to analyze and to discuss in a critical, analytical way images like this, that is, images profoundly sort of influencing the public discourse on religion, on borders, on migration. Now, let's move to another one. This is an older one, an illustration from Der Spiegel, right after uh, Khomeini, uh, sort of, no, before he died, of course. If not, there was no interview. Uh, that border they could not cross. And you can see the idea is also here, an old idea that there is a unity within Islam and that Islam is sort of slowly but surely taking over. Now that reminds me of something that I indicated in the first sort of slide, where I said that it was, I, I sort of, if you saw it, I said something about Anu Hijire. Did any of you notice it? So that was the Muslim or Islamic lunar calendar that I referred to. What does that start with? What is year one? That is 622, that is year one. Why? Because that is the year when the Prophet Muhammad migrated from Mecca to Yathrib, later Medina. So Islam is based on that notion of migration. In Islam also, and this is also something a scholar must explain to this, so sort of the broader public today, in Islam there are many notions of migration, like in Christianity and other religions, but Islam is very heavy. We have the notion of Dar al-Islam. We have the notion of the Ummah. That is one, that is unity. So actually, in a way, we can see scholars in Islam discussing whether there are borders that should be respected within the area of the Ummah, within Dar al-Islam, or there are not. And how is it with the borderline between Dar al-Islam and Dar al haf the world of war? the house of war. Can a Muslim go from the one world to the other? Right? Or should he actually go from Dar al Hab back to Dar al Islam if he doesn't have his right to perform his rituals? We have a lot of very interesting discussions going on within Islam in regard to migration and borders. We should also be able, as scholars, to tell the public at large about that. Now, if we move on to the next one, you see it's again a, D a Danish cartoonist. This is the same who made the very famous cartoon of Muhammad as, uh, as uh, sort, of, sort of the same one as he has under his arm. And this is a young Muslim who enters Danish politics. You can see there is a threshold, there is a doorway, there is a border. And he's coming into Denmark symbolized by the Danish Christian flag. And what is he looking like? He is, well, you don't really know. Is he a diplomat, is he a politician, or is he a warrior, a fifth colonist terrorist? This is the question asked about a guy who has been born and raised in Denmark and wanted to get into politics and do his job as a Democrat in Denmark. We have to explain things to people about this. We have to talk about stereotypes, prejudice, Islamophobia, past and present when we are scholars of religion. Now let me move to the next one. This is an old map of Europe. 
we have to be historical also. What has happened in Europe? Where did we have sort of Dar al-Islam? Where did we have a Muslim majority? What is the rest of that in terms of minorities? And you can see that I have sort of painted the Muslim world black. I didn't finish it. And then I have green for the Protestant Christianity and red for Anglican and Catholic. And then there is a red line between the Western Christianity and the Eastern Christianity. Not unimportant in terms of politics either. Here we have sort of from, from the time of, let's call him just Luther, a very famous Christian reformator. And, uh, and uh, you can see that once again, we have the, the sort of the image of the enemy and it doesn't look nice. No wonder people got scared. No wonder there was a mixture of stereotypes and real fear, as there are today, a mixture of real fear and sort of no fear. There are people out there who want to take over. There are Muslim terrorists and Islamists, of course. There are those who want to take away my beer from me when I sit down tonight. I would hate that to happen. They are there. And there are, of course, Muslims who think that there should be no demarcation line, no separation between religion and politics. They want you or them to go directly from devotion to the wall. And this is sort of an illustration of that within Shia Islam. And why is it Shia Islam? Because you can see the prayer stone down there that is supposed to also be what he can put into his gun for ammunition. So there is no sort of distance from the prayer hall, the prayer niche, to the wall, right? There is no distance. It says also here, from the prayer to the place of war. There is no distance. So how do I tell people about this fact at the same time as I try to deconstruct the stereotypes? It's a very difficult thing, but we have to do the work. Here is another illustration. I have analyzed textbooks on Islam. And you will see, once again, we have an idea long before Samuel Huntington. Huntington was late. It's long before 9-11. It's a long history we have of Islamophobia, of making an identity construction of Europe over against the significant other, the Muslim. And you can see here, it's an illustration of where Islam is in majority, where there are larger minorities, and then there is something called outposts. This is a word that comes from military language. So this is a war. This is not just a map of the spread of Islam. It's much more than the map of the world. Last but not least, it's also a job for a scholar of religion to show this. What do you think this is? This is the first page in my passport. It is Jesus Christ put into a runic stone sometime around 900 in Denmark by King Harold the Bluetooth. On the other side of the stone, it said, I, or the King Harold Bluetooth, made the Danes Christians. It's called the birth certificate of Denmark, right? the baptismal record. This was put into the Danish passports as an identity marker in 1997 when Denmark had to have European passports because we had to make sure that we could separate ourselves, identify ourselves over against the rest of all those crazy Europeans. So we put Jesus Christ in the passport. Huh. In a country where we pride ourselves of separating religion and politics, and where religion is supposed to be limited to the private sphere, right? These are all the kind of paradoxes we have to deal with, talk to people about, write about in newspapers, and teach about in schools, also at the university level, of course. So we have a lot to do, scholars of religion, when it comes to borders and migration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. Well, we've had one, four wonderful talks, and people don't look as if they're leaving yet. So. I suggest if anybody has a question for the speakers, or if a speaker wants to ask another a question, that you could.
come and use this mic. Uh, I know there are others in the audience who have significant experience uh, and current day experience in dealing with migrations. So I'll let you ponder a moment. But there are one or two things I wanted to uh, touch on that as I listened. And one was walls. We didn't perhaps have quite enough history until we got to term of what, how long humans have ineffectually struggled to define certain areas and keep others out. But walls do not work. And I wish, uh, as an American, that my president had some historical perspective on that. They were pointless. My other reflection was, um, a curious one, that in academe, we've used borders to want to redefine our fields, to become multidisciplinary, to create women's studies instead of being compartmentalized. And we talk about people who resisted as policing the boundaries or policing the borders. So I think there's been a very large intellectual trend to become more multi and more understanding. And on the other hand, a very disturbing and curious tendency for people to want to close their borders, to close themselves off, to close their minds. And Tim mentioned some of the aspects of religion that are threatening. I find it just as much threatening in the United States that we have a new radical Christianity that is terrifying. These are very strong white supremacists who are determined to take back what never was. but So we feel threatened too by that, not by people trying to come into our country from Mexico. So would somebody else like to step up and have a comment? Or I see Adama is here. I, yes, please. Can you come up so we can all hear? It would be wonderful. Thank you. Is there a microphone? Thank you, Chair. I am uh, Professor Chumbo from Cameroon. Um, the borders and boundaries. We in Africa have a, a very unique experience with boundaries. I was very impressed to see that your pictures show boundaries that are perfectly demarcated. Uh, we in Africa over the years have had boundaries that are very, very arbitrary. As you know, uh, it was in the, uh, the Berlin Conference of 1884 that Africa was partitioned. And the partitioning did not take into consideration any inherent natural realities. So that uh, you may find in the records, German records of the boundary between Cameroon and Nigeria, something like, uh, the boundary goes from an old Iroko tree to some sand dunes along uh, five kilometers. And when you go there, you find that there's no Iroko tree because the tree is all naturally no longer there. The lifespan of a tree is obviously quite short and the sand dune is not, not there at all. And that has created some of the problems that we all know. Uh, the only tangible boundaries that we have were those that involve natural uh, element, geographical element like the river or hill. And even those created even more problems because uh, in ancient times, the river was not a symbol of demarcation. It was a highway within a territory that was occupied by the same people. So you sail across the river and you move from one side to another. You are married on this side and you want to show your autonomy and independence. As a grown up, you move over to the other side and build. And then comes the colonial boundary. And it says the river now is the boundary. You need a passport, a passport to go from one end to another. And so uh, we have found in recent times uh, the kinds of differences that we had between Congo, uh, Kinshasa, and Congo, Brazzaville, 
which is exactly the same people across the river, and because of the political differences between Masambadeba and Mobutu, uh, with political ideologies, the people for many months will go without uh, crossing the boundaries. So arbitrariness of boundaries uh, has been a major problem. And um, we have a, a whole uh, scholarship on boundaries in Africa, uh, historians, and uh, it's a multidisciplinary enterprise that have also come up with some useful information about people and borders and boundaries in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's a very important point to make. Now, I'm told by uh, the organizers that we should at least allow people to go to the next session in the other building, which is beginning uh, in about 10 minutes' time. But I suggest, and I'm so glad there are others who want to discuss, but if we were allowed to stay in this room, those of who want to, uh, it would be the time, though, for people to go to the other sessions if they uh, wish. And thank you very much, and thank you to the speakers. Thank you.